Welcome, folks. Uh, my name is Peggy O'Neill Vivanco. I probably know most of you, if not all of you. I'm the Clean Cities Coordinator, um, housed at UVM's Transportation Research Center. And um, I'm here with Hannah November, who is, excuse me, our intern at, uh, at the Clean Cities Coalition. And we have this theme this year that we want to talk about transportation equity given the the covid covid disruption in all of our lives and um certainly in moving people and goods um th throughout so hannah do you want to so we're recording for those um who are, are concerned um and i ask that you know we, we all follow the protocol of just muting yourself if you're not talking if you're having some challenges with um with audio or video just turn off your your video um but as we as we start this um for those for those 50 and older like myself who just are registering for um for the vaccine what are you thinking what's the first thing you're going to do when you get fully fully vaccinated Anybody else? Other responses? <clears throat> Is it family? See my mom. Can you put the, re the question back up? Oh, okay. Play in person Mahjong. Oh, Melanie. <laughs> Can't wait to eat in a restaurant. Yeah, thanks. Um, I, I thought of that. I don't know if anyone else was awake last night because they felt like their roof was going to blow off. Um, but <laughs> that was one of the things as I was thinking about this meeting at you know two fifteen in the morning, um, and excited for my my first shot. Uh, just started thinking like I haven't seen my mom since two thousand nineteen. So excited for that. Even though I'm also excited for live music. Um, feel like visiting family and just and hugging. And I've kind of joked with folks that I might be one of those crazies on, um, not crazies, one of those, uh, you know, uh, hippies on Church Street with a sign that says free hugs uh, for just uh, kind of missing like some of that physical contact with, you know, people I see regularly. <clears throat> so thanks. <clears throat> thanks for that. Um, let's see. And I'm going to take control of the slides. Do you see my full view, Hannah, or is it? Yep, you're all good. Okay, thanks. So again, thanks for joining us. Um, we're going to go kind of quickly through our um, report from last year, um, upcoming events, the updates of what we're doing this year, and then get into the presentations from um, Kim and Sandy from CATMA, Bethany from Vital Communities, and Sebi Wu from um, VPIRG to really see if we can use this time to generate some ideas on what equity, transportation, mobility looks like and, and how we can elevate these conversations, not only within our organizations, but perhaps up to the state level. <clears throat> so Hannah, do you want to take over the um, emissions reductions uh, information from our 2019 data? Uh, yes, I would love to. So um, one thing we're really proud of from our 2019 data is the fact that our 67 stakeholder groups together diverted a total of 13,618 tons of greenhouse gases from the atmosphere. Um, and this is through the use of alternative fuels, idle reduction actions, and economy fuel improvements. Um, and so this is almost a 20% increase from our previous year's calculations. 
And so all of this information is collected from our annual report surveys, which is sent out to all of our valued stakeholders at the beginning of the year to collect data about the past year's operations. A lot of you have probably already filled this out already, um, but if you haven't, it's not too late. And we'd love to collect some information from you. And so the foundation of these emissions reductions really comes from the reduction of 1,539,975 gallons of gasoline that we have diverted. Um, and alongside this comes the reduction of 596,121 gallons of gasoline equivalent, which is mainly distributed through the use of liquefied natural gas, electric vehicles, and compressed natural gas that is used by all of our stakeholder groups. And so one question that we have for everyone is how one year later through the pandemic, how has transportation changed either generally or in your life, but feel free to um, put responses in the chat so we can all reflect on each other's um, changes in this big part of our lives. Okay. There we are. Yay. Hi, Peggy. <laughs> Okay, so we see a lot of responses about how people are spending a lot less time transporting, which is nice. Um, and so kind of going along with that, we have some expected changes for the year. Um, of course, 2020 was not under any circumstances really a normal year. And because of this, we are expecting a lot of variability in the data we're collecting from our annual report. Um, so far, we have collected about 75% of the annual report surveys from 2020. Um, and these surveys have already led us to a lot of valuable insights as to what we might expect when we look at the entire group. So the first thing is that we're gonna see a huge variability in fuel use causing an overall change in emissions. And we're seeing this huge shift because of how we have changed the way we're using transportation relating to our everyday lives. Um, like given the nature of the situation, public transportation ridership is down and single occupancy vehicle use is up. But in general, people are just traveling and commuting a lot less because I'm sure we can all relate to the fact that we don't have that many places to go these days. Um, and. In addition to this, a large part of the shift is the um, change to teleworking and remote working, meaning that the mileage from daily commutes will be significantly down, which is something we'll talk about later on in this presentation. In addition, we're seeing a lot, we're um, expected to see a lot less formal reporting, reporting giving the constant change of this past year, which is very understandable. And lastly, we have noticed slight reductions in operations across all of our stakeholders. Since starting in March, there was a pretty extended period of lockdown causing a lot of complete or temporary uh, business closures. And given the interconnectedness of the represented industries, these reduced operations have lasting effects now and into the future as well. This all being said, um, it's definitely not too late to fill out the annual report. So if you've not done so already, please do so because we would love to collect all the information possible and to truly understand the coalition's impacts. Back to you, Peggy. Great, um, thanks. Yeah, it will be interesting to see where we land. Um, 
Clean Cities, the Department of Energy, where we do our reporting, has um, has always had a uh, a mechanism to capture um, folks who do active transportation um, or you know van pooling, car pooling, ride sharing, and that um, as well as telecommuting. And we haven't captured that data before. We use a lot of information from uh, Dan Courier at Go Vermont for the van pooling, which is great. Which you know. We, you know, we, we, we think about like, oh, we're, we're putting an electric vehicle on the road and that's displacing this, but actually getting more people in fewer vehicles really moves the needle as well. Um, and so working with CATMA, trying to get, it will be some incomplete data this year, but to get some of the information from their members on um, how many folks um, are, are teleworking will, I think, give us a different a different picture. So maybe it won't be all um, doom and gloom as we see our numbers um, change, but the Department of Energy is expecting such. Uh, so update updates that we have. Um, I know that a lot of folks here are really all about fleet electrification, um, but Clean Cities is brand neutral and fuel agnostic, and um, we support all alternative fuels. We have an auto gas answers that's dealing with um, on-road um, propane. Um, and we're gonna have a, a lunch and learn on Thursday, the 29th. Details will be coming out soon on that. Um, and this, we can look at some of these um, alternative fuels, uh, certainly for the heavy duty sector as a transition to electrification until we have really tried and true data um, and efficacy for, for our region. So um, pr propane in heavy duty fleets, auto gas answers at the end of the month. And then we're also um, working with um, Jonathan from Local Motion, um, and uh, we're gonna do a film screening called Together We Cycle. We're working on the date and so forth. Well, at this point, it will probably still be a virtual screening um, and uh, more details will come forth on that. Next slide, Hannah. So project updates, you wanna talk about your sustainable campus fund? Yes, um, so one project that I've been working on through the coalition and through the greater UVM community is a proposal to the sustainable campus fund. So as an intern with um, the Vermont Clean Cities Coalition and an active UVM student, I submitted a proposal to research the potential of a university-wide fleet sharing system. Um, so if successful, this process would set the foundation for a model of campus-wide vehicle sharing that prioritizes safety and convenience for users with cost efficiencies and low carbon transportation, all of which are um, pretty substantial goals of the UVM climate action policies. Um, because of this, it will also reduce UVM's dependence on fossil fuels and increase equity across campus through improved shared mobility options. And um, yeah, so we're working with, with UVM on that. We've got great partners at Transportation and Parking Services. Um, and kudos to Hannah for writing this proposal um, and, and having it be accepted and, and um, funded. We're waiting for the funding to come in, but um, it looks like it's moving forward. Um, then um, two other projects with I think many of you know about, but just to give you um, quick up updates, um, working with, um, you know, a wide range of folks, um, including um, Linda McGinnis, um, Cara Robichek from um, Energy Action Network, Jennifer Wallace Broder, um, and Dave Roberts from VEIC, among others. Um, we are working on Replace Your Ride that is um, looking to build um, a purchase incentive for low and moderate income Vermonters to replace their older, higher polluting vehicle from 2010 or earlier with transportation options. So we have we have support from VTrans, we have support from Drive Electric, we have support from um, the state on this. It's, it's moving forward, it's written into the T-bill. I'm sure Dan, Dutcher and, and Dave might be able to jump in with, um, you know, kind of more exciting details um, as this moves forward. But it isn't just the vehicle piece, it's also, um, 
transportation options, meaning giving um, folks either vouchers or funding for electric bikes, regular bicycles, um, electric motorcycles, um, car share, ride share, and transit, even though transit's still free right now, um, you know, maybe uh, maybe combining a transit pass when the transit, if whatever happens with um, uh, fare free changes can be combined with one of the other transportation options. Um, so that's moving forward. That's been a great work. And then as we dive into each different sector on electric bikes, we're bringing in different partners. And as we bring in different partners, the important question is, who else do we need to have in this conversation? Um, future of rural transit that is looking at combined transit and school bus services in more rural areas. Um, we have an app, we reached out to superintendents, we reach out to um, towns and energy committees. We have an application open right now for interested partners to um, gather the information, very basic information to see who will be um, kind of ideal partners because it isn't going out into, you know, Greensboro necessarily, but looking into more, um, slightly more, more populated rural areas where there's a school and transit to look at efficiencies in combining those services. So that's moving forward and that application for school districts and towns is open and we have our first application in, so it's really exciting. Um, and in the meantime, we're interviewing Burlington, the city of Burlington and the school district because they have combined service. So what works, what doesn't, what, um, you know, what are the lessons learned? Next. <coughs> So before we go into this teleworking and equity, um, we just have a quick question um, about who, what organizations have um, existing teleworking policies. So just drop your yes, no, maybe. And some could even be a yeah, but. I like Dan, yes, and it's being updated. And <clears throat> yes, for COVID. So we are looking at. Um, a lot of yeah buts or um oh yes and then the does a telework policy only apply to covid i think that's important Okay, so um, uh, John Kaplan, does the, does your teleworking policy only apply to COVID nineteen? And you can put your response right in the um, in the chat. So what I'm seeing um, is that yes, there are there are policies. Many of us have COVID specific policies, um, and I say us because I work at the University of Vermont. Um, and when we think about our COVID policies and teleworking, it certainly impacts transportation. Um, it impacts um, equity, who's able to access this, um, and what are the different types of workers who are able to either because of their type of work or because of their, their, their pay scale. So with that in mind, um, Sandy and Kim, do you wanna take it over and talk about your teleworking and equity um, work? Yes, absolutely. Well, that was quick. Uh, thank you for having Katma here today. Um, 
And thanks to Vermont Clean Cities for inviting us. And it's great to see and hear and meet everyone. Uh, good morning, my name is Sandy Tebow, Executive Director at CAPMA, the Chittenden Area Transportation Management Association. And I'm pleased to have Kim Furtado, CAPMA's analyst with us today um, here as well. I thought I'd just um, provide a quick overview of CAPMA. I know many, many of you on this call are familiar um, with who we are, but just really quickly, um, we're a nonprofit 501c3 membership based organization. We were founded in 1992 by the three Hill institutions, Champlain College, UVM, the Medical Center, to jointly plan transportation and parking in ways to reduce environmental impacts, ensure more efficient land use, and provide sustainable transportation options for employees and students. We administer and manage a comprehensive suite of TDM, Transportation Demand Management. We'll start with the acronyms here. Um, so we administer and manage a comprehensive suite of TDM programs, including transit subsidies, incentives for biking and walking, a guaranteed ride home, um, bike share and car share support, and encouragement to telework. In 2015, we expanded to a regional uh, TMA, Regional Transportation Management Association, um, which meant that we opened up membership to employers and developers in Chittenden County. We also launched in uh, 2014 a regional employee transportation coordinator network um, with support from the Regional Planning Commission's annual work plan, and it was um, the goal is to get more businesses and developers at the table and engaged in the TDM conversation. Um, so, you know, we've had some significant growth over the past five years. <clears throat> I guess next slide. So these are the areas we'll spend the next 10 or 15 minutes sharing with you, probably quickly moving through them. Um, we'll provide information on CATMA's telework tools, and I will touch on equity with telework, um, providing some thoughts and discussion points. And then um, you will hear from Kim on a couple of surveys we conducted over the past six months or so. Um, and the results. Okay, so let's start with a simple definition of telework. Telework is working at an alternative location other than your central work site. As we all know, in March 2020, many employers were quickly faced with redefining their workplace, adapting to this complete tele, uh, telework workforce in the wake of COVID. So as many of you already indicated, you know, immediately had to develop a telework policy in response to COVID, COVID focused. Um, some employers, uh, you know, these polls are great that you just conducted, Peggy. They indicate some employers had telework policies in place. Some had to quickly develop a policy. Um, some are maybe still be working at, or struggling with uh, implementing and developing a telework policy for the for the unknown future. Um, and I think we all know that telework will continue um, in some capacity, whether it's for the next six months or a year or two years or more. Um, I've talked to some people that think telework is, is short term, as in the next year or two, and then we'll be back to normal. Um, and some feel that, you know, it, it will continue further. So I think we'll have to see how it evolves. Um, certainly telework is instrumental in reducing VMTs and greenhouse gases, as Vermont Clean Cities touched upon earlier. <clears throat> So knowing this, and with CATMA's transportation experience, we saw an opportunity to help employers navigate this now highly utilized TDM strategy, telework. So we created some tools. We have a step-by-step -step guide on developing a telework program. Uh, we have an assessment uh, guide for employers. We have sample policies, 
uh, best practices, resources, and surveys, which are all accessible on our website. Currently, we're working with the Clark Group in Montpelier on developing a formalized telework outreach and marketing campaign um, that will include a toolkit uh, full of resources and tools and policies for employers. And we expect that will be completed this summer. Shout out uh, to VTrans um, with awarding us some funds through the MTI grant, Multimodal Transportation Innovation Grant. Dan, hope I got that right. Um, and then um, in regards to surveys, CATMA has been conducting surveys for years, as many of you know, and we developed this employee survey that will be available to employers. And, you know, as everyone knows, surveys are an important tool to measure the performance of a program, inform policy, monitor trends, employee satisfaction with telework. Um, so we are anxious to um, conduct these surveys for employers um, in the region um, when assessing their telework program and inform developing their policy, the data, all this data will be very useful um, for the employer. And next slide. Um, just wanted to touch really quick on benefits. I, I think we all know most of these and but again maybe just some um, discussion um, or thoughts here uh, so certainly for employees the benefits of uh, flexibility work-life balance um, has been a great benefit for employees that are able to work from home um, the cost savings you know saving on their commute to work um, maybe downsizing a vehicle um, they are happy, they're stress-free, that impa impacts their morale, productivity. And for employer benefits, um, there's cost savings on office space, utilities, parking. They are having the ability to re reconfigure office space. Um, it positively impacts uh, employee productivity and morale. They can probably it impacts their ability to recruit and retain talent. And I'm sure that there are, are more um, benefits here, but just to outline a few. Next slide. And so this was touched on a little bit earlier. Um, again, I just wanted to provide some food for thought here, maybe some discussion points for today or in the future. Um, there's a lot of businesses and organizations right now working on an equitable telework policy in the workplace. As an employer creates this policy, the question of equity quickly arises. Telework seems to be mostly an option for certain jobs, positions, and tasks. It probably applies more to managerial or professional office positions. And there's this perception of flexibility with telework. And for those who cannot telework due to their jobs and tasks, the lack of this flexibility creates a sense of unfairness um, that could impact their mor morale and their productivity. Um, previously, um, I mentioned the cost saving benefits for employers. However, an employee working from home has probably experienced an increase in personal costs, more electricity, more water, more heat. Um, although they have probably saved on vehicle costs or maybe got rid of that car. I've heard of um, employees at some employers asking for financial assistance with increased utilities or a faster modem or internet. And I've heard of employers offering employees an annual stipend to assist with equipment and technology. So things to consider um, for employers to consider when developing their policy. Um, another thought on telework and um, is managers managing employees differently. There's a lot of tools that we've all been using, MS Teams and Slack, 
which some managers use because this is a great, these are great communication mechanisms. Um, I've also heard of managers that are asking employees to check in every 15 minutes and report on their activities or work. So um, different management styles, everyone is working, you know, through the management of a telework program. So I think this will continue to evolve as we become better experts at telework. Um, so I think that telework is going to continue in some capacity, some kind of hybrid model, maybe two or three days in the office um, and the other days working from home. I don't know if a hybrid model is easier to manage than a full on telework, just something I, you know, I've been thinking about recently. Um, so employers are carefully navigating equitable telework policies right now, which I don't think is any is an easy task. Um, so Katma's um, excited to have our toolkit and some resources to formally promote out there this summer to provide assistance and support um, to employers um, as they develop their telework programs. So I hope that was interesting and helpful um, with the time that I had and maybe spurred some thoughts or questions or discussion for later. Um, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Kim to share the survey data unless you want to pause for any questions. No, Sandy. Let's um, let's keep uh, let's keep on with um, with Kim's presentation. I think um, you you get brought up um, a lot of issues um, that we can discuss later. Thanks. Sounds good. Thank you. All right, Kim. Hi, everybody. Um, so I'm just going to briefly share some survey results that Katma has received over almost a year now. I think like nine months. Uh, which is kind of wild to think about. But the first survey I will speak about is something that we pushed out in Vermont with some stakeholders this past June. This survey was launched nationally by the Association um, of Com for Commuter Transportation, um, but we were able to get a, a state-specific link and send that out to all Vermonters. And if you've heard me go over this data before, you've heard this fun fact, but I, I love it, so I keep sharing it is that Vermont had the second highest response rate out of any state. Uh, the highest was Hawaii, which I just I think is cool and fun. Uh, so this data was really asking how people commuted before COVID and how they think they'll commute after COVID and what would make them more comfortable. Obviously, our understanding of like what after COVID looks like, I think is really different now than it was back in June. Um, and we know it will be like a much longer um, gray area than I think people who are optimistic um, were when they might have answered this back in June. But so the first thing, as I think something we're all really nervous about is that drive alone rates will skyrocket. And that is obviously, I think, depending on location and who you are, might be true. Um, but according to this survey result of Vermonters, we actually see people saying that they're less likely not to drive alone after COVID than they were um, before COVID. It's a 3% decrease. So it was 70% before COVID and, and people are predicting 67% of the respondents will be uh, driving alone to work. And obviously when you're answering a survey in the future, it might be a little bit idealistic. So we'll love to see what um, we actually see in the next few months and year. Uh, but yeah, so we see this huge, not huge, a little decrease in drive alone, and that is really helped mostly by what you'll see is an increase in, in telework. So here, this shows the mode shift. Um, so obviously we see saw a decrease before and after COVID in shared modes, so both transit and carpooling. Um, our, though our transit decrease is 31%, it's not that a huge percentage of Vermonters were taking the bus before. So in the way that New York City might be impacted by a decrease in transit of 31%, it's doesn't, it's not as monumental as it seems. But something I really would would like to note is that the folks who are most likely to ride the bus and in state that that is their main mode of transportation 
the largest group to say that when split by income bracket were those in the lowest income bracket. And so if we see if transit has to make changes, if they have to make cuts, it's like who is going to be hurt most by that? It's probably not going to be those folks who have the option to telework and who have multiple cars for their household to get around. So something important to know. Um, but again, like we were able to see that small decrease in driving alone because more people are either biking to work if they're going to work. Um, and again, this survey was done in June, so could also be some idealistic Vermonters who don't <laughs> who don't want to bike in the winter. But also there are some very strong people out there who do bike all year round, and I applaud you because I could not. Uh, but also then a huge increase in teleworking. And it's just a question of how often people will do these modes over driving alone, how often, and like who is doing it, I suppose, is the question. Okay. And so that's that survey. The second survey I will talk about, if I can do that, uh, is a survey Katma put out to our employer transportation coordinator network. So it's, uh, as Sandy talked about, just a person at each of our um, businesses that we work with um, who kind of, we meet up, we talk about transportation, their needs, what's new. Um, and so we sent this survey out in the fall asking people about telework specifically at their organizations and if they had a plan to go back to the office and how teleworking fit into that. And we were asking one out of curiosity, but also so that CABMA could help support them with, with the tools that Sandy had mentioned. So um, when looking at this, I split our, our membership by like sector. And as you see, there's like the highest percentage of employees working from home and for most of us, I think that was March of last year um, when we all just kind of stopped and went home and worked. So you see almost 100 percent of people, 75 to 100 percent of people working uh, remotely. Obviously, <laughs> the UVM Medical Center is part of our network, so they um, thankfully were, uh, were working very hard um, in keeping us safe. And then also our retail uh, is a grocery store, so they were also um, in the in the workplace, really helping us get through those tough months. But recently, we've been able, obviously, to be a little bit more mobile, and some people have gone into the office. And you'll see that there is a a much wider distribution of folks who are in and folks who are teleworking, and it really is split by industry. So those folks in academic, municipal, manufacturing, and healthcare industries are all working in the physical workplace at a much higher percentage than our other types of employers, such as like administrative services, business services, who have the option and the ability because of job to work remotely. And there are folks who work in business services who like might do something in an office that they have to be in. And especially as you get to bigger employers that um, employ a variety of different folks doing different types of jobs when you're implementing telework, how do we include folks who, who might not be able to actually telework and how are we giving them a, an option that also allows them some flexibility and maybe could be good for the planet. Um, and then the last thing we asked people on this short little survey was something that we kind of already uh, talked about today as a group, but it was just asking if people had a telework policy and if they were um, interested in strengthening that policy. And I think you all answered this for yourselves and it was it was very similar. So I think we've got a lot of work to do, a lot of questions still to be answered, but um, we're really excited to keep an eye on this with all of you as we move forward. Great, thanks Kim. And then this was just, this is just a, a visual graphic of our employee transportation no coordinator network and our membership who were um, participated in these surveys and who we work with. Thank you. Thank you, Sandy and Kim, for, for that presentation. Um, I think it's really helpful to think about, um, um, as you pointed out, how um, if we really re reduce um, transit routes because of lower transit ridership, we're marginalizing the people who use that mode of transportation most or um, that's their only way to move around. So just that idea that 
our actions um, and our choices sometimes have a huge impact um, on others. So, so thanks, thank you so much for that. Um, oops, let me take control. All right. So now we are going to um, hear from Bethany Fleischman from Vital Community. From Vital Community, she's a transportation program manager there, and Bethany is working on a big e-bike project down in the Upper Valley. Bethany, do you want to take it over? Yeah, thank you, Peggy. Thanks. Can you guys all hear me? Yep. All righty. Um, and I'm also just so glad you have a slide there because I don't have slides, but I was suddenly panicking. So I'm like, oh, I don't have slides. It means everyone's be staring at my face. So <laughs> thanks for having a slide there. Um, so um, thanks, Peggy, um, for inviting me. And um, so I'm with Vital Communities. And one thing um, that I do in the transportation program is run um, the other TMA in the state, the Upper Valley TMA. So it's like Katma, but down in the Upper Valley. Um, so um, I, I don't have slides, but I have a bunch of notes, which are to keep me on task. Otherwise, I will go off in many different directions. Um, and so all the things I'm going to be mentioning, um, I have lots more to say about each of them. And so we can discuss them during the discussion section. Um, and I know that some of you, just looking at the list of participants, some of you know some of the stuff already or have heard of it already or heard me talk about it. So just trying to, but I'm just trying to like, you know, cover everything. So basically, first, I'm going to talk about um, broadly about some of the ways our transportation system isn't equitable. And then I'm going to talk about, um, as Peggy mentioned, um, the project I'm working on this year that's designed to make it just a tiny bit more equitable. Um, so this is first just some basics around transportation equity. Again, probably many of you are thinking about this already, but it's good to just put it all in one place. Um, so, you know, our transportation system in Vermont and in, indeed the whole United States is really designed for people who have cars and can afford to drive them. So, of course, that leaves out uh, many elders, many youth, um, people who don't have a license. And of course, there's many reasons why people don't have a license, um, people who are physically unable to drive. Um, and then people who can't afford a car, um, the annual cost of car ownership, if you include all the different, um, you know, payments and insurance and tires and all that stuff is more than $8,000. So that's a pretty big number. Um, and then just thinking about how poverty and lack of access to resources often correlates to age, illness and disability, race and ethnicity, immigration status and other factors. Um, and of course, you know, we've been talking about this and many of you know this already, you know, there's, there are lots of other ways to get around uh, without a car, even in Vermont, you know, bike, bus, walk, telework, et cetera. Um, but, um, you know, the, the distribution is not always even or equitable. And so I'm just going to go th through some questions that help illustrate what I mean by that. Um, you know, just thinking about which towns can afford to not just install, but maintain good quality sidewalks. Um, you know, huge cracks and bumps or inconsistent snow plowing or bad drainage mean a wheelchair or walker or a stroller can't navigate. And honestly, there have been times in White River when I just on my own two feet can't move to the sidewalk and have to walk in the street. Um, which towns can afford to put in bike lanes? Who can afford to buy or rent housing in the towns or neighborhoods with safe bike and walk infrastructure? Um, you know, I know we think about this a lot in the state, but, you know, cost of housing tends to be less in places far from the downtowns. And then, of course, the transportation costs are then much higher. So, you know, they're not actually more affordable to live in the in the outskirts of the downtowns and because you're not able to save any money by, by, uh, by walking or biking. Um, and then, you know, one thing I've been thinking a lot about recently um, is just even if there is good multimodal infrastructure, does everyone feel safer, welcome walking, biking, taking the bus or carpooling? And, you know, I think about that, especially as it relates to gender and sexuality and race, but there's also other reasons too. Um, which towns and corridors or regions of the state have robust bus service? Does the bus run um, at night on, we on weekends when many low wage workers are commuting, or is it mainly for people working nine to five? Um, is the bus information in the language someone needs or accessible to someone without a computer or who, or who has poor eyesight? Um, and then, you know, of course, what um, Sandy and Kim were talking about, where's the good internet access and where's the bad internet access and how does this impact people's ability to telework or access telehealth or online school? Um, and so some of the ways that, um, I mean, there's so many ways to start addressing the inequities, but just two things I wanted to mention that are things that are on my mind and, and that I'm kind of using um, 
as I go forward in my work is um, one, getting to know your system, um, uh, you know, riding, um, you know, ride the bus, walk or bike to the store or work or wherever and find out what works and doesn't work. And so I've had a car since, well, actually I got a little later than most Vermont kids, but whatever. Um, I've had a car for years, um, but I've also been riding my bike uh, for transportation for 25 years since I was a teenager. Um, I've been riding the bus for 15 years, so I know really well what works and doesn't work. Um, and I've learned a lot from people who rely more on the bus and more on um, bike and walk than I do. Um, and, you know, I've also learned a lot from my colleagues around the state who are much further along in their uh, work on transportation equity than I am. So, but getting to know the system and where the holes are yourself is helpful. I think it's really hard for transportation professionals to talk about this stuff if we don't actually use it. Um, and and you know, just also recognizing that all the knowledge that on the holes really originally comes from people who are directly impacted by inequitable systems. And so, you know, related to that um, is asking for input from the people who are not getting where they need to go. Um, we tend to think of highly paid professional consultants as the experts. Um, but, you know, someone who can't get to work, appointments, school, et cetera, is actually really an expert on the holes in their local transportation system. Um, and so, you know, we at Vital Communities or, you know, me and the transportation program at Vital Communities, we're really taking a lead from Old Spokes Home, um, the bike shop up in Burlington, um, their work around this, um, as well as racial justice work around the country, um, where there's sort of like thinking more about, you know, who are the experts and also compensating people for their expertise. And so um, we're putting together a system at Vital Communities, not just for transportation, but for all of our work in farming, in local economy, in energy, um, around um, not just uh, seeking input from community members who we haven't heard from before, but also paying people, you know, um, uh, you know, paying them for their for their expertise because um, you know it's important and and we um, it's just not something traditionally that a lot of nonprofits like Vital Communities have done. So I'm gonna talk now about my e-bike subsidy project um, in particular. Um, so as I think probably most of us know, e-bikes are becoming pretty popular. Um, they're super fun. They're obviously a greener and healthier way to get around. And the pedal assist is really helpful with the hills and distance that makes bike transportation in Vermont a big challenge. You know, I was mentioning before, like you can't afford to live close to town. So you end up living farther away. But if you have an e-bike, maybe that means you don't need to take your car. Um, so Local Motion, I think Jonathan is on the call um, from Local Motion. So Local Motion's e-bike lending library, the statewide one, as well as the um, the upper, the one that's permanently based in the Upper Valley. Um, you know, these are these are great ways for people to try out e-bikes. And there's a huge number of people who are purchasing their own e-bikes after borrowing. Um, but e-bikes, of course, are several thousand dollars, so it's not accessible to all. And, you know, something I'm thinking more and more about as a transportation professional is it's really not great to be promoting e-bikes as a green and wise transportation choice if they're really only accessible to the most well-off among us. Um, I just see it that a solution that works for only the most well-off really isn't a solution. And it ends up also just building a weird kind of class-based virtue dynamic anyway, that's really not healthy for anybody. Um, so we wrote a grant in the fall um, for through the VTrans MTI uh, program, thanks Ross and Dan, um, to provide a subsidy for people in the Upper Valley who test an e-bike either through the local motion library or elsewhere, but can't afford to buy their own. Um, and so I've hired an equity consultant um, whose name I can share um, to help me see places where, you know, in putting together the grant, my work plan, I'm making assumptions that are, you know, well-meaning, but are harmful to the project goals. And so she's helping me a lot throughout the process of like putting this project together. Um, and so I'm gonna talk a little bit about the eligibility and, and sort of some of the equity pieces we're, we're putting in there to make sure that this works for people. Um, so the eligibility is low and moderate income Vermonters. Um, people need to demonstrate that they have a transportation need for the e-bike. Obviously they should use it for fun as well, but they need to be using it for transportation. Um, we really don't want to make the application process onerous, um, more relying on people's word and not asking for a ton of proof, just because a lot of programs, especially for low income people, have really strict eligibility. And that just like further shames people who are for being low income, which is not what we want to do. Um, and then one um, one thing that equity consultant is helping me with is just thinking about how low and moderate income actually means many people. I mean, there's probably plenty of us who fall into you know, low or moderate income. 
Um, and so how do we make it equitable within that parameter? Um, so we're not just providing the subsidy for people on the higher end of that parameter um, who have more education and social capital for whom an e-bike is least likely to be life-changing. Um, so we have enough funding for 10 or 15 bikes plus accessories. I'll talk about the accessories after. Um, and so we're going to try to divide it up so that the so that we're targeting different groups of people within what it means to be low and moderate income. We're going to try to have one or two bikes for the unhoused people in White River Junction. Um, there's a lot of people living in shelters, a lot of people living in hotels. There's a lot, also a lot of people camping um, in secret spots in the forest and on the riverbank. Um, and so, and you know, a lot of them are working in West Lebanon or wherever um, and, and don't have cars. Um, and so those people would, we would most likely be providing 100% of the subsidy for the bike and accessories. Um, and I'm also thinking, I have friends who work with undocumented people in the community um, who are working in a lot of the construction sites. Um, and I wanna work with them to see if we can get bikes to undocumented workers and families um, in our areas as well. Um, and to make up sort of to offset that there'll be a handful of people will, will be getting bikes too that probably will need 100% of a subsidy, um, which we didn't really plan on because I wasn't sort of thinking in terms of that when I wrote the grant um, is, you know, that they, there probably will be a handful of people on the top end, people who are moderate income and really only need a partial subsidy or don't need help with purchasing accessories. And that's going to offset, you know, the people who were going to need 100% of the cost covered. Um, and then just thinking about like what even low income means. I mean, I have a lot of friends who, you know, have a low income, but, and maybe are on Medicaid and other assistance, but, you know, they have education and are likely not going to be low income for very long or forever. Um, and then versus like thinking about people who are living in generational poverty and, and just don't have the same resources to kind of get out of that. And so those are people for whom an e-bike would, would really make a much bigger difference in their lives. Um, and so we're just thinking about sort of like dividing up so we're at reaching out to a variety of different people and not just saying anyone who's low income and moderate income, but like breaking it up into, into in, so that everyone's kind of getting a shot at this. Um, we're offering a no interest loan um, with the understanding that many people will not be eligible for a loan, but there might be people for whom that would be helpful. So we're gonna do that. Um, accessories are a big component of what I see making this equitable. Um, and so what I mean by that, I mean, for example, you know, I live in a second floor apartment. Um, I don't have a garage. And so I can't have an e-bike because I have nowhere to put it. And so we're thinking about, you know, even just um, getting super good locks and like a tarp to cover so that a bike can be, you know, outside if someone lives in a second story apartment or something. Um, but also things like winter maintenance, you know, if someone, if this is a, um, you know, if they're not going to be able to afford a couple hundred bucks to do winter maintenance after the end of a season, like that's not going to work for them either. So just sort of making sure it's long-term, um, has long-term sustainability so people can keep using this. Um, and we're really going to be seeking input from participants throughout the process. So we're able to adapt as needed. Um, again, just recognizing that it's like um, VTrans provided the opportunity for the money. I wrote the grant and like thought of what made sense to me, but like, I'm not going to be using this program. And so we want it to be, you want, we want to be responsive to what's actually going to work for people. Um, and then um, one thing I'm really working with the equity consultant on is just looking at the way Vital Communities does, you know, our regular outreach methods, um, you know, and just, you know, asking ourselves, do they reach low income people? Do they reach people of color? Often not. Um, and so um, our the consultant is going to be working with us on learning how to do equitable community engagement. Um, and, you know, I think that's we that's not something we, we haven't really done it yet so we're just sort of starting but um you know basically it's just it's just kind of recognizing that we often reach kind of the same usual suspects who are interested in green transportation and and this is this is a departure from what we've done um and you know even just also recognizing it's like i i grew up and i still live and work in white river junction i know lots of people and it's I've, it's always been easy for me to connect kind of one-on-one -on -one with people across like all kinds of differences, race and class, old timers and newcomers. And I like to think of myself as like kind of doing equitable community engagement just because I am in my own hometown and I know everybody and I like know how to connect, but like acknowledging that I actually still bring lots of assumptions to each interaction and in many ways have been trained by society to kind of make these assumptions and work most easily with certain people. So I think that's a, a big piece of this is just like you know, the states provided the money for this, we have the idea, but like actually implementing it is gonna require some work in terms of changing the way we do some of our work. 
Um, and so this whole project is a pilot, um, as I think all the MTI projects are, and it'll run through the end of the year. Um, I think we're going to learn a lot. I think it's going to be really helpful having the equity consultant um, and also the input from the people who are participating in the project who are getting the bikes. Um, and so I'd love to like talk with people throughout the season to anyone who's interested in learning more about our process, um, because I think it's it's going to be helpful for all of us. Um, and that is about it. Um, um, I don't know how I, I know I talked really fast and said a million things, but um, I have more to say on all these things, but I think I'll wrap it up for there and um, let it go into this, the discussion at the end. So um, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Bethany. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, and uh, I, I really do, um, Sebi, before we start with you, I, I really do want to give a, a, a big shout out to Dan Courier and VTrans for the MTI grants. Um, they're supporting a lot of, um, of these initiatives, including the Future of Rural Transit, Bethany's work as well, um, Katma's work. So, um, you know, we, uh, we really appreciate, Dan, your support on that and VTrans. Um, what I want to just take a quick moment is while we're looking at telecommuting um, as an example, we're also looking at, um, oh, hang on, Hannah, just one second, wait, <laughs> sorry. Um, and looking at um, electric biking. I also want us to keep in the back of the mind, we have a wide range of, of stakeholders here. And I don't wanna forget about our, our drivers, our drivers of heavy duty vehicles, our farmers, um, the utility folks who are working on bucket trucks, um, fuel providers, food service providers, um, and, um, and, and those folks, when we think about transportation equity, um, for many of those, there's, those folks are still using um, diesel engines because diesel engines last a long time, right? They last a long time, they're expensive to replace. Um, electric is not a viable option yet, we're working on it. But when we think about transportation equity, I don't want, and again, because we're clean cities and we look at all the, all the alternative fuels is, I don't want it to be an us versus them. It is how do we bring everyone forward um, and, and look at equity in, in um, as a holistic lens as possible, recognizing that some of the folks who are driving these vehicles are possibly having health impacts um, as a result of the diesel fumes or the trucks that are running through neighborhoods or idling in certain neighborhoods um, are causing um, a health, health impacts in certain communities. So this isn't just bikes and teleworking, but how we bring this forward in all these aspects. So thanks. Um, and then um, quickly, Jen Green, who is a part of the Urban Sustainability Director Network, um, has something in the chat about some mobility and equity webinars. So um, if you want some information on that, um, just put Jen Green and your contact information in the chat so she can send you that information. Is that correct, Jen? I think it would be easier if I just sent it to you and anybody that's interested, um, Perfect. you can just forward. Okay, that sounds good. Send it to me. All right, um, and now for a quick poll question before uh, we get into SEBI. So just looking at how your organization is working towards equity, it is certainly a conversation many of us have been having quite deeply this past year. Um, some of the some of what we do, we're doing okay. Um, so just fill out this uh, fill out this this questionnaire. Thanks. If you want to put in more than one, then go ahead and put it in the chat. We don't have that. We have limited capabilities here on Teams with some of these questions. Um, so it looks like many of us are engaging in some training and educational opportunities. Um, and 
fewer of us are actually able to do outreach to underrepresented groups. Uh, maybe that's the next the next step for us. Um, I'm not not sure. Yep. So as we finish that up, um, I'd like to introduce now um, Sebi Wu, who is a climate and racial justice um, associate at VPIRG. Um, and I heard Sebi a couple weeks ago, uh, maybe it was a transportation for Vermonters, give a presentation on this idea of developing a transportation equity framework. And I thought this would be a nice way to round out these, um, these two other presentations. And then hopefully to launch us into a conversation of what do we what do we do with this now? How, what does it mean for um, you know heavy duty sector? What does it mean for the environmental sector? Um, and where where do we take um, all this information? So Sebi, go ahead. If you have slides, um, you can take control, or you can just speak. I I do not. I, I shared Bethany's no slide anxiety. So thanks, uh, Hannah and Peggy, for providing a stand in. I appreciate it. Um, so hi, good morning, everybody. My name is Sebi Wu, and I'm the Climate and Racial Justice Associate at the Vermont Public Interest Research Group, VPIRG. Um, thank you so much, Peggy, and the Clean Cities Coalition for inviting me to the call. Um, and Bethany for getting us started in our discussion about how we can best approach equity in transportation. Um, so much that has been presented today re really resonates with me. Um, so I, I look forward to the discussion piece. Um, just in case folks are unfamiliar, uh, VPIRG is one of the largest environmental and consumer advocacy nonprofits in the state with 50,000 plus members and supporters statewide. Um, we do a lot of legislative ad advocacy and grassroots organizing on a variety of issues. Primary among those and most relevant to this group um, is statewide action on the climate crisis that centers equity. Um, so my plan is to take about five to 10 minutes to share how we at VPIRG have initially been approaching this work where VTrans seems to be uh, in integrating equity work um, across the agency, particularly into their planning and programs, um, and hopefully jumpstart a discussion about how we can effectively advocate for equity in the transportation sector while also reducing climate pollution. Um, so first I'll share that we at VPIRG came to this work uh, this year trying to evaluate and understand the equity impact of specific initiatives designed to modernize and decarbonize our transportation system. So we felt that many of these programs like Mileage Smart, Replace Your Ride, PEV incentives, char charging programs uh, in targeted areas, e-bike incentives, et cetera, intuitive, intuitively had an equity component to them. Um, and as we looked into the question of whether there is currently a more proactive equity evaluation of these programs led by the agency or otherwise, we came to the conclusion that there could be a better fleshed out overarching strategy um, for integrating equity into what otherwise might be evaluation of programs on a more individual case by case basis, which is absolutely critical as well. Um, so we feel that this is important uh, that such a strategy be systematic, um, really inclusive and proactive, some of the things that Bethany hit on earlier. Um, so as we see it, the, the state could develop something like a transportation equity framework working title, <laughs> um, an overarching approach that would start uh, with meeting people where they're at, um, really from the ground up to understand unmet needs in the transportation system and how that can inform our transition to a low carbon transportation system uh, with outcomes from those conversations, which is particularly relevant, you know, in the midst of COVID-19 where our transportation system seems to be transforming and um, we sort of have a lot of uncertainty about what lies ahead. Um, I, I, we see this as starting with a deep investigation that brings stakeholders, uh, the usual suspects, uh, it, but also and especially new stakeholders into conversations around how that might be done. Um, and we see that as something that would be extremely useful and uh, hopefully revamping public participation in some way. Um, the equity framework might more explicitly guide work uh, between the agency, the regional planning commissions, and especially with local communities, both individuals and particular stakeholder groups who have typically been underserved by the by the transportation system. Uh, the key, I, I keep hitting on this, is systematizing this work in some way rather than responding in more of a patchwork fashion. It seems that planners at the regional and state level are really invested in this work 
um, though it is still in its early stages. Uh, so moving forward, I think it will be important to understand unmet needs, gaps in uptake in certain programs, and crucially, how we can better integrate transportation planning into a holistic equity framework that considers things like access to a healthy environment, health care, school, economic opportunities, food, civic engagement, and the basically the whole access to the to the whole fully human experience. Um, so I've had uh, great conversations with reps from the RPCs who are really enthusiastic, enthusiastic about this equity work and some have shared really great examples of new initiatives that are starting up at the regional level with local stakeholder groups. And I think some folks are on the call right now who are in, involved in that work. Um, and I do think um, in addition to that, there's an appetite for more of a systematic push towards equity in Vermont's transportation system as it relates to planning and programs. Um, needs to be bottom up and top down, uh, an integrated process. Uh, we're all are included in the in the conversation. So the bottom line um, on where our thinking at VPIRG is at is that um, there's still more, more work to do. There's a lot of excellent work being done across the state, um, but if policy policymakers, planners and stakeholders stakeholders like us um, can continue work to establish a truly inclusive and effective vision um, for transportation equity across Vermont um, to ultimately influence how policy programs and projects are designed, um, planned, selected, and implemented. So it's simple enough. <laughs> um, that's a bit of a high, high level context for our thinking and vision for this. Um, I'll briefly share what I understand about AOT's work on, on this, though I have no particular authority on their internal work, and I know we have a couple of reps from the agency here, so you may be better, in a better position to share more updates as well. Uh, then love to open it up for discussion, continue this conversation. Um, so it's great news that the agency seems to be headed in really the right direction and to be committed to doing this equity work. Um, and I think it's really important that those of us in this space continue to engage um, hands on on what they're doing along the way. Uh, as an ex example for conceptualizing this, Susanna Davis, the executive director of racial equity for the state breaks agency wide equity work out into three conceptual buckets. Um, the agency as an employer, um, as a system throughout the transportation system and as a provider of services. Um, and it really seems that the agency is starting to move towards deeper work on the latter two, the system wide and provider of services, having worked a lot on DEI policies as an employer. Um, so started uh, to focus on equity as it relates to transportation projects, programs and planning. Um, according to testimony from VTrans, uh, the agency in both transportation committees in the legislature um, this year, they are creating an equity, inclusion, and diversity technical advisory committee at the agency level, developing equity screening criteria to incorporate into project selection through VPSP2, undertaking an inventory of current AOT practices and programs, conducting a gap analysis thereof, and uh, ultimately developing and implementing an agency equity work plan to implement recommendations from that analysis. So all, all those initiatives are underway this year. Um, so we see this as a really excellent opportunity for folks in this space to engage um, in this development and expansion of AOT's equity work, um, because I'm sure it will be better for hearing more voices and ideas. And so I think that's where all of us come in. Um, and for our part, VPIRG will be following developments in this work with an eye towards how we might also support this process as we become more involved in transportation advocacy. So that's about all I've got. Uh, thanks for your attention uh, and glad to be here and look forward to continuing this conversation. Thanks. Thanks so much, Sebi. Wow, that was um, that was jam packed with uh, some some good kernels of information. Um, so now I, I want to open this up um, really to a conversation. Um, so as Sebi mentioned, um, you know, at least the AOT there the possibility of a framework. Um, and if we go back to what Sandy and Kim presented, what teleworking means for our own organization. So those three buckets of employer, system, and provider of services, we can think that about our own organizations. We can also think about what we expect of organizations with whom we work, uh, contractors that we support or supply. And, and so how do we advocate for transportation equity 
in the state. And as my you know previous statement before Zebi started, it's it's also looking at um, you know uh, our, our drivers as well um, and some of the, the heavy duty fleet because I feel like the state incentives are so focused right now on passenger vehicles that we we really also should be supporting um, some of our businesses and and how to transition to some cleaner fuels. And I know, I think I saw Casella on here somewhere. Um, and I know Casella uses um, CNG in some of their, in their vehicles, <clears throat> in their refuse trucks. So we have, we do have heavy duty sectors who are really helping to move the needle. I know Cabot does a lot of telematics and um, a more efficient uh, um, kind of transportation um, route using. So what do we need to do to also bring them into the fold? So let's um, let let's uh, let's dig into this um, with um, I guess just a general question of maybe even starting with you know your organization whatever it is where it where are you falling in these equity conversations um, both uh, both. How did Sebi? How did you put it? Top down and bottom up. <laughs> Jen, Jen Green, do you want to talk? Yeah, thanks, Peggy. Are, are you opening it up now? Um, yep, I'm I, opening I, I up now. Really. Yeah, I, I just want to note, and I, I really appreciate Bethany, uh, Sebi, Sandy, and Kim's presentations. Those were super and a great way to kick us off. It was just striking to me, though, that thus far I don't think we've talked about race. And I think um, when we talk about equity and we sort of refer to equity more generally, I think it would behoove all of us, myself included, um, to make sure that we're talking about race and people of color in, in particular, because I, I, I worry that um, I, I worry that we're, 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 we have an opportunity to normalize conversations around race. And I just think it's important that we, when we define equity, that we really call call out race in our conversations. Um, so yeah, so thank you so much. And when, when I talk about equity, you know, when we talk about equity and, and people of color at the Burlington Electric Department, where we are thinking about electric buses, um, certainly the e-bikes, and um, even maybe more specifically, um, our support of, of Old Spokes Home and their equity transportation group. So yeah, thanks, Peggy. Thanks for letting me get on my soapbox for just a, a quick moment. No, no, thanks. I, I appreciate that. And I think um, I think it's important to remember, you know, Vermont is um, was it, we're, we're the second whitest state in the union behind maybe Wyoming. Um, but there are there there are areas. Um, certainly my kids go to the diversest school in um, in Vermont, uh, the Burlington School District. Um, so I think looking at race as well as the overlay of, um, of economics is really important. So normalizing that conversation um, is pretty key. Thanks, thanks for that. Any, anybody else, your organization, what else we need to include in this conversation? Who and how do we um, elevate these discussions to the state level? What are we missing? Uh, oh, but Go Bethany ahead. here. I just wanted to, I mentioned Old Spokes Home in my presentation, but I just want to shout out that they're doing so much. I think that certainly with the Vermont Transportation Efficiency Network that I convene, they've been the ones who are bring, who just have such a great model that I think I've certainly learned so much from and we should all be talking more about. Laura, are you still, are you still on the call? Laura Jacoby from Old Spokes? Yeah, I am. Thanks, Peggy. <laughs> yeah, I don't um, want to put you on the spot, but if you have something to add to this, because I do feel like you have a you have a great model and and um, maybe share some of your um, your approaches and organizing them. Uh, yeah, thanks. Uh, my internet's going in and out, but um, um, I'll try. Uh, yeah, no, I um, you know just the importance of engaging diverse populations and being really um, proactive about that and intentional about that. And it takes a long, long time. Um, and, and it takes a lot of effort, I think, as we're all learning. Um, but it, it's critical. Um, and I, we've just 
to learn so much from our community reps. I mean, just perspectives that, you know, that we don't even, you know, I mean, you just don't know because it's not your perspective, but it's so critical. Um, so now we have nine, we're up to nine uh, community representatives that we, um, you know, we get, we give them stipends for their, um, for their insights and um, really um, about a lived experience that we, you know, that we would have no idea about if we, if we were engaging them in the conversation. And um, uh, we have, you know, some from the BIPOC community, but also folks that travel in, in a wheelchair and are, um, uh, you know, older, maybe less abled, but um, so, yeah, and just how important it is to engage them in conversa in the conversation. And I love the idea um, of, you know, VPIRG or whoever really holding the state accountable for um, making sure that those voices are in included in conversations about transportation policy and where we're um, um, how we're allocating uh, for transportation, uh, just to make sure that it's it's being allocated in a way that's equitable and that makes and that you know ensures that everyone can get to to where they need to go. Because uh, the reality is is that folks like our community reps they haven't been at the table, they're not at the table, and decisions are getting made with all the best intentions that don't. Um, you know that that are not helping or not serving um, a lot of people um, simply because they're not at the table and and the fact that they're not at the table is the you know is all of our responsibility it's not you know that they don't want to show up right that's not it so anyway it's a lot of hard work um, and I'm really happy that we're starting to hold ourselves accountable to it so thanks, Laura. One thing that um, and this strikes me back from like my graduate school days is when we think about these participation uh, in focus groups or, um, or or any kind of volunteering we do, um, there's a certain type of person who can do that. And that is someone who has leisure time, who has some free time. And generally, if you have that free time, it's because you have a certain certain income. And it isn't that you aren't passionate about it. It isn't that you don't have a perspective. So I, I think this um, this uh, monetizing, you know, giving a stipend um, for people's time to give their participation, I think is really um, really an important component to, um, you know, when we're writing our proposals, um, if we're the ones who are still being able to write proposals and if we speak to VTrans, if we speak to our employers, it is then how to support um, the time for those who are adding their perspectives. So thanks for that. Um, so now I guess maybe this might go back to Sebi um, or if anyone, I don't want to put anyone from VTrans who's, if they're still on the line here on the spot, but what's our next What's our next step? How can we communicate some of these issues? At least if we're going up to the, um, if we're going up to the state level, what is our best mechanism to um, to kind of communicate? Is it through T4VT? Is it through um, VTEN? Um, is it as individuals? Is it as organizations to communicate? What are some of these these talking points? What are some of these key values um, in addressing equity? Any ideas on how to move this forward effectively? Anybody? My, my, my answer would be yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, we're, we, we, like I said, we picked this up and we, we work in the legislature a lot. Um, and that's like kind of why I've been following the testimony. And that's where this work originated was advocating for the transportation modernization package um, for low carbon uh, transportation alternatives. So my head always goes to legislation. <laughs> um, but I think I think it is like 
it is having conversations with the folks who are in decision making roles about this, like continued conversations with folks at RPCs, at VTrans, um, on, on an individual basis, and then on on the talking points piece, I don't have anything immediate, <laughs> um, but I, I do think that pending the development of this work and our continued engagement, um, it is possible that this would be the kind of thing that we could codify in legislation um, in, the, in the next legislative session. Um, and, and really, I think it's partially like speaking to the great work that Old Spokes Home has been doing. They've been collaborating closely with their the CCRPC. Um, and I think part of it is enabling and encouraging RPCs to seek out groups like Old Spokes Home to do this work on on the local level um, and funding that because uh, like you said, people need to be paid for their their lived experience and expertise and really appreciate Jen Green's uh, bringing up the the race component. It's really important. Um, among many other, uh, you know, cross cutting uh, disadvantages that folks experience. Thanks, thanks, Debbie. And I see from um, Bethany just put a note in the, the chat that the next Vermont Transportation Efficiency Network meeting, which is April 14th, from 1 to 3 p.m., Bethany, if I have it correct. Yeah, that's um, right. Great. Um, uh, she's going to lead a discussion um, about putting together equity toolkits and frameworks. Um, so I, I think I'm still in the process of figuring that even out. So that, uh, that's okay. You know, you've got yourself. two full weeks to, to figure that out. <laughs> Um, but I think this, I, I think, you know, with each of us and our different organizations, as we try to move these, these conversations, it's, it's iterative, right? And not only that, but we also um, need to get other voices in. And I see someone else's hands up. Sandy, go ahead. One idea I was thinking, you know, there's a lot of organizations that are clearly working on on um, equity and transportation and which is wonderful and something that I've had in my mind is about the state um, developing or cre like a transportation summit I feel like there's so many changes um, with transportation with transit with sharing with COVID with telework the equity piece I wonder, you know, if it's something, I don't know who sort of takes the lead on it or if it's a collaboration of some partners um, and have a like a, maybe a full day transportation summit that has sessions on um, some of these different areas and that we can invite some legislators to and some, you know, local and state agencies or government officials. So just something that's been on my mind. Um, I don't know the timing of that, you know, if it's spring 2022, um, you know, you know, we'd need to find some funding to host the event. So just putting that out there on the table. Uh, I think that's, um, that's a great idea. And I think there are probably several of us, several uh, um, of us, you know, different organizations from Clean Cities, maybe even the TRC, um, I saw uh, Bethany V10 looking at how then that idea of then how do we present out um, and present up. That's a great idea. Um, Laura, did you have your hand up? Uh, yeah. Um, well, one place that we're planning on starting locally is um, uh, so this this um, series of um, workshops that Jen Green is uh, kind of, I guess, the local coordinator for. Uh, so we're having our community reps uh, attend some of those. Um, it's a series, and then and we're inviting other, um, you know, you know um, Chinning County agencies that that work with low income and moderate income folks who care, you know, who struggle with transportation. So that you know, through that we develop some common language, and then um, and then our community reps are really they're excited to to do a, what they're calling a teach-in um so we were thinking after that series then we could all get on um a facilitated um workshop and our community reps will can talk about how their lived experiences and and um you know what that looks you know what some of these transportation challenges look like for them in chittenden county 
Um, and then maybe we can agree on some, um, you know, ways forward here locally. Great. Thank you. Um, and I think I like that idea that, you know, that you specified it, it's, it's Chittenden County because I think, you know, ideas of sustainability and ideas of um, our outreach, we can have, you know, templates and ideas, um, but the voices in different areas of Vermont are probably going to sound a little bit differently, rec recognizing those, those, the, that diversity within the diversity is important. Sandy, did you have another comment? Or was your hand still up from before? No, um, just up from before. I'm not sure how to get rid of it. <laughs> okay, that, that's okay. I, I won't call on you again. Um, so I guess we have, um, first I would just want to thank everybody um, for for being here, for participating in this really important conversation. Um, we can, we'll draft up some notes um, and then anyone who wants to kind of join in, um, you know, in brainstorming and adding to that would be great. Um, before we uh, before we sign off, though, I don't know if there are any updates from stakeholders, um, Abby Blything, Jim, Barr, um, or even Sandy. Anyone want to talk about the Green Ride bike share update? Or any other stakeholder updates um, in your world? I, I can talk about the Green Ride, and, and I'm, I hope that uh, Sandy will jump in. Uh, so Green Ride bikes, uh, there's been a, a tumultuous roller coaster with them. You know, we have the seven speeds, we've had them. Um, we've been in and out of conversations with the company that owns those, uh, that, that has the program for us. And unfortunately they were bought out. <clears throat> I lost count, I wanna say three times, maybe four. Uh, but the last time they were bought out, they were bought out by a company called Bolt. And Bolt uh, has reasserted the uh, commitment to us and you know, I, I was not a believer that they were actually going to get here because I'd heard that several times before, but the e-bikes are actually in Burlington. They're in a warehouse, non-disclosed, so nobody on this call runs and goes and tries to break them out. Um, <laughs> but the intent is that we will have those bikes out as soon as we can get the agreement, which I know UVM was one of the ones that kind of lagged with lots of different people that wanted to have comments on it. So thank you, Sandy, for your patience as we compiled those notes, but I'm very excited about uh, the prospect of within the next several weeks for everyone here to see a new e-bike system out there. Um, and I will share that the old bike system will be going away. They will be taking, unfortunately, the Ben and Jerry's and 7th Gen bikes um, out of out of uh, our area and probably reusing those in other areas, areas that do not have the e-bike component. Uh, but we're going to have 200 of those damn things here. And uh, you know, and, and that's going to really open up that maybe it's the last mile for many people in their commutes, but it's also going to be open for a lot of folks to be able to get around that can't own a car. Right. So, Sandy, jump in. No, I, I think that 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 covers that and they're going to be rolling out here pretty soon. And there's a lot of details that we're daily working on with the hubs and permitting and agreement, um, but it's happening. Um, they're teal green um, bikes. You might see them rolling around town um, over the next few weeks. I think they're doing some testing with them. So um, lots of, you know, communications and marketing to work out sort of on a daily basis here. But Abby yeah. just added to the chat something that I think is very worthy of saying. Bolt is owned by Usain Bolt, uh, who is the world's fastest man. And uh, we're thrilled to have a BIPOC owned business running our bike share. So uh, that that's exciting. And if you want a sneak peek, uh, keep an eye out on uh, April 22nd, which is Earth Day. Uh, you might see a few of them riding around should they actually be put out into the hubs prior to then. Uh, we're in con conversations with uh, the general manager for the our, our regional program to uh, use those for uh, our UVM bikes uh, students to get out there and actually ride them around. And, kind of a bike train. So Abby. That, that is great news. Yeah. Okay. Thanks for putting it in the putting that comment in there, Abby. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Jim. Thanks, Abby. Thanks, Sandy. Um, 
Again, thank you all for attending. Thank you, Hannah November, my fantastic intern. Thank you, Sandy and Kim from CATMA for your presentation on teleworking, as most of us are still sitting at our homes right now with our kids in the background. Um, thank you, Bethany, for your presentation um, on, on equity and starting the conversation and really planting this seed in me um, a while back. And Semi Wu, thank you. I haven't met you in person, but looking forward to you at some point. Um, so I look forward to continuing this conversation. Um, and thank you all and have a great um, a great day before the next snow day that might be tomorrow. <laughs> See you, thanks. Thanks, bye folks. Bye-bye. <laughs>